The Feud Buster by Robert Howard. These here durned lives which is being circulated around is making me sick and tired. If this slander don't stop, I'm liable to lose my temper, and anybody in the Humboldts can tell you when I loses my temper, the effect on the population is worse than fire, earthquake, and cyclone. First off, it's a lie that I rode a hundred miles to mix into a feud which wasn't none of my business. I never heard of the Hopkins Barlow War before I come in the Mesquital country. I hear tell the Barlows is talking about suing me for destroying their property. Well, they ought to build their cabin solider if they don't want them tore down. And they're all liars when they say the Hopkinses hired me to exterminate them at five dollars a scalp. I don't believe even the Hopkins would pay five dollars for one of their mangy sculps. Anyway, I don't fight for hire for nobody. And the Hopkinses needn't bellyache about me turning on them and trying to massacre the entire clan. All I wanted to do was kind of disable them so they couldn't interfere with my business. And my business, from first to last, was defending the family honor. If I had to wipe up the earth with a couple of feudin' clans whilst so doing, I can't help it. Folks which is particular of their hides ought to stay out of the way of tornadoes, wild bulls, devastating torrents, and an insulted elkins. But it was Uncle Jeopard Grimes' fault to begin with, like it generally is. Durn near all the calamities which takes place in southern Nevada can be traced back to that old lobo. He's got an ingrown disposition and a natural talent for pestering his feller man, especially his relatives. I was settin' in a saloon in war paint, enjoying a friendly game of cards with a horse thief and three train robbers, when Uncle Jeopard come in and spied me, and he come over and scowled down on me like I was the missing lynx or something. Pretty soon he says, just as I was all sought to make a killin', he says, How can you sit there so free and careless with four ace cards in your hand when your family name is being besmirched? I flung down my hand in annoyance and said, Now look what you done. What you mean blatting out information of such a private nature? What you talking about, anyhow? Well, he says, during the three months you've been away from home, roistering and wasting your substance in riotous living, I've been down on Wild River punching cows at thirty a month, I said fiercely. I ain't squandered nothing nowheres. Shut up and tell me whatever you're a-talking about. Well, says he, whilst you've been gone, young Dick Jackson, a chawed ear, has been courting your sister Ellen and the family's been expecting him to set the day any time. But now I hear he's been bragging all over Chaudier about how he done jilted her. Are you going to sit there and let your sister become the laughing stock of the country? When I was a young man, when you was a young man, Daniel Boone warn't welt yet, I bellered, so mad I included him and everybody else in my irritation. They ain't nothing upsets me like injustice done to some of my close kin. Get out of my way. I'm heading for chawed ear. What you grinning at, you spotted hyena? This last was addressed to the horse thief in which I seemed to detect signs of amusement. I weren't grinning, he said. So I'm a liar, I reckon, I said. I felt an impulse to shatter a demijohn over his head which I done, and he fell under a table hollering bloody murder, and all the fellows drinking at the bar abandoned their liquor, and stampeded for the street, hollering, Take cover, boys! Breckenridge Elkins is on the rampage! So I kicked all the slats out of the bar to relieve my feelings, and stormed out of the saloon and forked Captain Kidd. Even he seen it was no time to take liberties with me. He didn't pitch but seven jumps. Then he settled down to a dead run, 
and we headed for Chawed Ear. Everything kind of floated in a red haze all the way. But them folks which claims I tried to murder em in cold blood on the road between war paint and chawed ear is just narrow minded and super sensitive. The reason I shot everybody's hats off that I met was just to kind of calm my nerves, because I was afraid if I didn't cool off some by the time I hit chawed ear, I might hurt somebody. I am that mild mannered and retiring by nature that I wouldn't willingly hurt man or beast nor engine unless maddened beyond endurance. That's why I acted with so much self-possession and dignity when I got to Chaudier and entered the saloon where Dick Jackson generally hung out. "'Where's Dick Jackson?' I said, and everybody must have been nervous, because when I boomed out they all jumped and looked around, and the bartender dropped a glass and turned pale." Well, I hollered, beginning to lose patience. Where is the coyote? G g give me time, will you? stuttered the barkeep. I, uh, he, he, uh. So you evades the question, eh? I said, kicking the foot rail loose. Friend of his, and eh? Trying to protect him, eh? I was so overcome by this perfidy that I lunged for him and he ducked down behind the bar, and I crashed onto it bodily with all my lunge and weight, and it collapsed on top of him, and all the customers run out of the saloon, hollering, Help! Murder! Elkins is killing the bartender! This feller stuck his head up from amongst the ruins of the bar, and begged, For God's sake, let me alone! Jackson headed south for the Mescital Mountains yesterday! I throwed down the chair I was fixin' to bust all the ceiling lamps with, and run out and jumped on Captain Kidd and headed south, whilst behind me folks emerged from their cyclone cellars and sent a rider up in the hills to tell the sheriff and his deputies they could come on back now. I knowed where the Mescitals was, though I hadn't ever been there. I crossed the California line about sundown, and shortly after dark, I seen Mescatal Peak looming ahead of me. Having calmed down somewhat, I decided to stop and rest Captain Kidd. He weren't tired because that horse has got alligator blood in his veins, but I knowed I might have to trail Jackson clean to the angels, and they weren't no use in running Captain Kidd's legs off on the first lap of the chase. It weren't a very thickly settled country I'd come into, very mountainous and thick-timbered, but pretty soon I come to a cabin beside the trail, and I pulled up and hollered, Hello! The candle inside was instantly blowed out, and somebody pushed a rifle barrel through the window, and bawled, Who be you? I'm Breckenridge Elkins from Bear Creek, Nevada, I said. I'd like to stay all night and get some feed from a horse. "'Stand still,' warned the voice. "'We can see you again, the stars, and these four rifle guns a kiverin' you.' "'Well, make up your minds,' I said, because I could hear em discussing me. I reckon they thought they was whispering. One of em said, "'Ah, oh, he can't be a Barlow. Ain't none of them that big.' T'other and said, "'Well, maybe he's a dern gunfighter they sent for to help em out.' Old Jake's nephew's been up in Nevada. Let's let him in, I said a third. We can mighty quick tell what he is. So one of them come out and loud it would be all right for me to stay the night, and he showed me a corral to put Captain Kidd in and hauled out some hay for him. We gotta be careful, he said. We got lots of enemies in these hills. We went into the cabin, and they lit the candle again, and sot some corn pone and sow belly and beans on the table, and a jug of corn liquor. They was four men, and they said their names was Hopkins, Jim, Bill, Joe, and Joshua, and they was brothers. I had always heard tell the Mescital country was famed for big men, but these fellows wasn't so big, not much over six foot high apiece. On Bear Creek they'd be considered kind of puny and undersized. They weren't very talkative. 
Mostly they sought with their rifles across their knees and looked at me without no expression onto their faces. But that didn't stop me from eating a hearty supper and would have ate a lot more only the grub give out. And I hoped they had more liquor somewheres else because I was pretty dry. When I turned up the jug to take a snort, it was brim full. But before I'd more than dampened my gullet, the darn thing was plumb empty. When I got through, I went over and sat down on a raw hide bottom chair in front of the fireplace where they was a small fire going, though they weren't really no need for it, and they said, What's your business, stranger? Well, I said, not knowing I was going to get the surprise of my life, I'm looking for a feller named Dick Jackson. By golly, the words wasn't clean out of my mouth when they was four men onto my neck like catamounts. He's a spy, they hollered. He's a cussed Barlow. Shoot him, stab him, hit him in the head. All of which they was endeavoring to do with such passion they was getting in each other's way. And it was only his over-eagerness that caused Jim to miss me with his buoy and sink it into the table instead. But Joshua busted a chair over my head, and Bill would have shot me if I hadn't jerked back my head so he just singed my eyebrows. This lack of hospitality so irritated me that I riz up amongst them like a bar with a pack of wolves hanging on to him and commenced committing mayhem on my hosts, because I seen right off they was critters which couldn't be persuaded to respect a guest no other way. Well, the dust of battle hadn't settled. The casualties was groaning all over the place, and I was just relighting the candle when I heard a horse galloping down the trail from the south. I wheeled and drawed my guns as it stopped before the cabin, but I didn't shoot, because the next instant there was a barefoot gal standing in the door. When she seen the ruins, she let out a screech like a catamount. You killed him! she screamed. You murderer! Aw, oh, I ain't neither, she said. They ain't hurt much, just a few cracked ribs and dislocated shoulders and busted legs and such like trifles. Joshua's ear'll grow back on all right if you take a few stitches into it. You cussed Barlow, she squalled, jumping up and down with the hystericals. I'll kill you, you damn Barlow. I ain't no Barlow, I said. I'm Breckenridge Elkins of Bear Creek. I ain't never even heard of no Barlows. At that, Jim stopped his groaning long enough to snarl. If you ain't a friend of the Barlows, how come you asking for Dick Jackson? He's one of them. He jilted my sister, I roared. I aim to drag him back and make him marry her. Well, it was all a mistake, groaned Jim. But the damage is done now. It's worse you think, said the gal fiercely. The Hopkinses have all forted theirselves over at Pap's cabin, and they sent me to get you all. We got to make a stand. The Barlows is gathering over to Jake Barlow's cabin, and they aims to make a foray onto us tonight. We was outnumbered to begin with, and now here's our best fighting men laid out. Our goose is cooked plumb to hell. Lift me on my horse, moaned Jim. I can't walk, but I can still shoot. He tried to rise and fell back, cussing and groaning. You got to help us, said the gal desperately, turning to me. You done laid out our four best fighting men, and you owes it to us. It's your duty. Anyway, you says Dick Jackson's your enemy. Well, he's Jake Barlow's nephew, and he come back here to help him clean out us Hopkinses. He's over at Jake's cabin right now. My brother Bill snuck over and spied on him, and he says every fighting man of the clan is gathering there. All we can do is hold the fort, and you've got to come help us hold it. You're nigh as big as all four of these boys put together. Well, I figured I owed the Hopkinses something. So after setting some bones and bandaging some wounds and abrasions, of which there was a goodly lot, I saddled Captain Kidd, and we sought out. As we rode along, she said, That there is the biggest, wildest, meanest-looking critter I ever seen. Where'd you get him? He was a wild horse, I said. 
I catched him up in the Humboldts. Nobody ever rode him but me. He's the only horse west of the Pecos big enough to carry my weight, and he's got painter's blood and a shark's disposition. What's this here feud about? I don't know, she said. It's been going on so long everybody's done forgot what started it. Somebody accused somebody else of stealing a cow, I think. What's the difference? They ain't none, I assured her. If folks wants to have feuds, it's their own business. We was following a winding path, and pretty soon we heard dogs barking, and about that time the gal turned aside and got off her horse and showed me a pen hid in the brush. It was full of horses. We keep our mounts here so's the Barlows ain't so likely to find em and run em off, she said, and she turned her horse into the pen, and I put Captain Kidd in but tied him over in one corner by himself. Otherwise he would have started fighting all the other horses and kicked the fence down. Then we went on along the path, and the dogs barked louder, and pretty soon we come to a big two-story cabin which had heavy board shutters over all the windows. There was just a dim streak of candlelight come through the cracks. It was dark because the moon hadn't come up. We stopped in the shadow of the trees, and the gal whispered like a whippoorwill three times, and somebody answered from up on the roof. A door opened a crack in the room, which didn't have no light at all, and somebody said, Matt you, Elizabeth? Air the boys with you? It's me, says she, starting toward the door. But the boys ain't with me. Then all at once he throwed open the door and hollered, Run, gal, they's a grizzly bar standin' up on his hind legs right behind you. Oh, that ain't no bar, says she. That there's Breckenridge Elkins from up in the vatty. He's going to help us fight the Barlows. We went on into a room where they was a candle on the table, and they was nine or ten men there and thirty-odd women and children. They all looked kind of pale and scared, and the men was loaded down with pistols and winchesters. They all looked at me kind of dumb-like, and the old man kept staring like he weren't any too sure he hadn't let a grizzly in the house after all. He mumbled something about making a natural mistake in the dark and turned to the gal. "'Where's the boys I sent you after?' he demanded, and she says, "'This gent must em up so's they ain't fitten for to fight. Now don't get rambunctious, Pap. It were just a honest mistake all round. He's our friend, and he's gunnin' for Dick Jackson.' "'Ha! Dick Jackson!' snarled one of the men left in his Winchester. Just let me get my sights on him. I'll cook his goose. You won't neither, I said. He's got to go back to Bear Creek and marry my sister Ellen. Well, I says, what's the campaign? I don't figure they'll get here till well after midnight, said old man Hawkins. All we can do is wait for em. You mean you all sets here and waits till they comes and lays siege, I says? "'What else?' says he. "'Listen here, young man. "'Don't start telling me how to conduct a feud. "'I growed up in this here, and it were in full swing when I was born, "'and I done spent my whole life carrying it on.' "'That's just it,' I snorted. "'You lets these dern wars drag on for generations. "'Up in the Humboldts we bring such things to a quick conclusion. "'Mighty near... Everybody up there come from Texas, original, and we fights our feuds Texas style, which is short and sweet. A feud which lasts ten years in Texas is a humdinger. We winds em up quick and in style. Where at is this here cabin where the Barlows is gathering? About three miles over the ridge, says a young fellow they call Bill. How many is they? I asked. I counted seventeen says he. Just a fair-sized mouthful for a Elkins, I said. Bill, you guide me to that there cabin. The rest of you can come or stay. It don't make no difference to me. Well, they started jawing with each other then. Some was for going and some for staying. Some wanted to go with me and try to take the Barlows by surprise, but the others said it couldn't be done. They'd get ambushed themselves and the only sensible thing to be did was to stay forded and wait for the Barlows to come. They'd given me no more heed, just sought there and augured. 
But that was all right with me, right in the middle of the dispute when it looked like maybe the Hopkinses would get to fighting amongst themselves and finish each other before the Barlows could get there. I lit out with the boy Bill, which seemed to have considerable sense for a Hopkins. He got him a horse out of the hidden corral, and I got Captain Kidd, which was a good thing. He'd somehow got a mule by the neck, and the critter was almost at its last gasp when I rescued it. Then me and Bill lit out. We followed winding paths over thick-tempered mountainsides, till at last we come to a clearing, and they was a cabin there, with light and profanity pouring out of the windows. We'd been here in the last mansion for half a mile before we sighted the cabin. We left our horses back in the woods ways and snuck up on foot and stopped amongst the trees back of the cabin. They're in there tanking up on corn liquor to whet their appetites for Hopkins' blood, whispered Bill, all in a shiver. Listen to em. Them fellows ain't hardly human. What you gonna do? They got a man standing guard out in front of the door at the other end of the cabin. You see, they ain't no doors or windows at the back. They's windows on each side, but if we try to rush it from the front or either side, they'll see us and fill us full of lead before we can get a shot. Look, the moon's coming up. They'll be starting on their raid before long. I'll admit that cabin looked like it was going to be harder to storm than I'd figured. I hadn't had no idea in mind when I sought out for the place. All I wanted was to get in amongst them, Barlow's. I does my best fighting at close quarters. But at the moment I couldn't think of no way that wouldn't get me shot up. Of course I could just rush the cabin, but the thought of seventeen Winchesters blazing away at me from close range was a little stiff even for me, though I was game to try it if they weren't no other way. Whilst I was studying over the matter, all to once the horses tied out in front of the cabin snorted, and back up in the hills something went and an I.D. hit me. Get back in the woods and wait for me, I told Bill, as I headed for the thicket where we'd left the horses. I mounted and rode up in the hills toward where the howl had come from. Pretty soon I lit and throwed Captain Kidd's reins over his head and walked on into the deep brush, from time to time giving a long squall like a cougar. They ain't a catamount in the world, can tell the difference when a Bear Creek man imitates one. After a while one answered, from a ledge just a few hundred feet away. I went to the ledge and clumb up on it. There was a small cave behind it and a big mountain lion in there. He gave a grunt of surprise when he seen I was a human and made a swipe at me, but I gave him a bat on the head with my fist, and whilst he was still dizzy I grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and hauled him out of the cave and lugged him down to where I left my horse. Captain Kidd snorted at the sight of the cougar and wanted to kick his brains out, but I give him a good kick in the stomach himself, which is the only kind of reasoning Captain Kidd understands, and got on him and headed for the Barlow hangout. I can think of a lot more pleasant jobs than toting a full-growed mountain lion down a thick-timbered mountainside on the back of an iron-jaw outlaw at midnight. I had the cat by the back of the neck with one hand, so hard he couldn't squall, and I held him out at arm's length as far from the horse as I could. But every now and then he'd twist around so he could claw Captain Kidd with his hind legs, and when this would happen, Captain Kidd would squall with rage and start bucking all over the place. Sometimes he would buck the dern cougar on to me, and pulling him loose from my hide was worse than pulling cuckleburrs out of a cow's tail. But presently I arrived close behind the cabin. I whistled like a whippoorwill for Bill, but he didn't answer, and weren't nowheres to be seen, so I decided he got scared and pulled out for home. But that was all right with me. I'd come to fight the Barlows, and I aimed to fight them, with or without assistance. Bill would just have been in the way. I got off in the trees back of the cabin and throwed the reins over Captain Kidd's head, and went up to the back of the cabin on foot, walking soft and easy. The moon was well up by now, and what wind they was was blowing toward me, which pleased me because I didn't want the horses tied out in front to scent the cat and start cutting up before I was ready. The fellers inside was still cussing and talking loud as I approached one of the winders on the side, and one hollered out, Come on, let's get started. I craves Hopkins' gore. 
and about that time I give the cougar a heave and throwed him through the winder. He let out an awful squall as he hit, and the fellers in the cabin hollered louder than he did. Instantly a most awful bustle broke loose in there, and of all the whooping and bellering and shooting I ever heard, and the lion squalling amongst it all, and clothes and hides tearing so you could hear it all over the clearing, and the horses busting loose and tearing out through the brush. As soon as I hove the cat, I run around to the door, and a man was standing there with his mouth open, too surprised at the racket to do anything. So I takes his rifle away from him and broke the stock off on his head, and stood there at the door with the barrel, intending to brain them barlows as they run out. I was plumb certain they would run out, because I've noticed the average man is funny that way, and hates to be shut up in a cabin with a mad cougar, as bad as a cougar would hate to be shut up in a cabin with an infuriated settler of Bear Creek. But them scoundrels fooled me. Appears like they had a secret door in the back wall, and whilst I was waiting for them to storm out through the front door and get their skulls cracked, they knocked the secret door open and went piling out that way. By the time I realized what was happening and run around to the other end of the cabin, they was all out and streaking for the trees, yelling blue murder, with their clothes all tore to shreds, and them bleeding like stuck hogs. That their catamount sure improved the shining hours whilst he was corralled with them barlows. He come out after him with his mouth full of the seats of men's breeches, and when he seen me, he gave a kind of despairing yelp and taken out up the mountain with his tail twixt his legs like the devil was after him with a red-hot branding iron. I'd taken after the Barlows, sought on scuttling at least a few of them, and I was on the point of letting bam at em with my six-shooters as they run, when just as they reached the trees, all the Hopkins men riz out of the brush and fell on em with piercing howls. That fray was kind of peculiar. I don't remember a single shot being fired. The Barlows had dropped their guns in their flight, and the Hopkinses seemed bent on whipping out their wrongs with their bare hands and gun butts. For a few seconds they was a hell of a scramble, men cussing and howling and bellering, and rifle stocks cracking over heads and the brash crashing underfoot. Then before I could get into it, the Barlows broke every which way and took out through the woods like Jack Rabbit's squalling judgment day. Old man Hopkins come prancing out of the brash waving his Winchester and his beard flying in the moonlight, and he hollered, The sins of the wicked shall return on to them. Elkins, we have hit a powerful lick for righteousness this here night. Where'd you all come from? I asked. I thought you was still back in your cabin chewing the rag. Well, he says, after you pulled out, we decided to trail along and see how you come out with whatever you planned. As we come through the woods expecting to get ambushed every second, we met Bill here who told us he believed you had an ID for circumventing them devils, though he didn't know what it was. So we come on and hid ourselves at the edge of the trees to see what had happened. I see we've been too timid in our dealings with these heathens. We've been letting them force the fighting too long. You was right. A good offense is the best defense. We didn't kill any of the varmints, was luck, he said, but we give em a prime lickin'. Hey, look there. The boys has caught one of the critters. Take him into that cabin, boys. They lugged him into the cabin, and by the time me and the old man got there, they had the candles lit, and a rope around the Barlow's neck, and one end throwed over a rafter. That cabin was a sight, all littered with broke guns and splintered chairs and tables, pieces of clothes and strips of hide. It looked just about like a cabin ought to look, where there had just been a fight between seventeen polecats and a mountain lion. It was a dirt floor, and some of the poles which helped hold up the roof was splintered, so most of the weight was resting on a big post in the center of the hut. All the Hopkinses was crowding around their prisoner, 
and when I looked over their shoulders and seen the feller's pale face in the light of the candle, I give a yell. Dick Jackson! So it is, said old man Hopkins, rubbing his hands with glee. So it is. Well, young feller, you got any last words to orate? Nah, said Jackson sullenly. But if it hadn't been for that derned lion spilin' our plans, we'd have had you Dane Hopkinses like so much pork. I never heard of a cougar jumpin' through a winder before. That there cougar didn't jump, I said, shoulderin' through the mob. He was hev. I'd done the heaven. His mouth fell open and he looked at me like he'd saw the ghost of sittin' bull. Breckenridge Elkins, says he. I'm cooked now for sure. I'll say you air, gritted the fellow who'd spoke of shootin' Jackson earlier in the night. What are we waitin' for? Let's string him up. The rest started howlin'. Hold on, I said. You all can't hang him. I'm gonna take him back to Bear Creek. You ain't neither, said old man Hopkins. We're much obliged to you for the help you give us tonight, but this here's the first chance we've had to hang a barlow in fifteen year, and we plan to make the most of it. String him, boys. Stop, I roared, stepping forward. In a second I was covered by seven rifles, whilst three men laid hold of the rope and started to heave Jackson's feet off the floor. Them seven Winchesters didn't stop me. But for one thing I'd have taken them guns away and wiped up the floor with them ungrateful mavericks. But I was afeard Jackson would get hit in the wild shooting that was certain to foller such a plan of action. What I wanted to do was something which would put em all horse de combat, as the French say, without killing Jackson. So I laid hold of the center post, and before they knowed what I was doing, I tore it loose and broke it off and the roof caved in, and the walls fell inwards on the roof. In a second, they wasn't no cabin at all, just a pile of lumber with the Hopkinses all underneath and screaming blue murder. Of course, I just braced my legs, and when the roof fell, my head busted a hole through it, and the logs of the fallen walls hit my shoulders and glanced off. So when the dust settled, I was standing waist-deep amongst the ruins, and nothing but a few scratches to show for it. The howls that riz from beneath the ruins was blood-curdling. But I knowed nobody was hurt permanent, because if they was, they wouldn't be able to howl like that. But I expect some of them would have been hurt if my head and shoulders hadn't kind of broke the fall of the roof and the wall logs. I located Jackson by his voice, and pulled pieces of roof board and logs off until I come to his leg, and I pulled him out by it and laid him on the ground to get his wind back, because a beam had fell across his stomach, and when he tried to holler, he made the funniest noise I ever heard. I then kind of rooted around amongst the debris and hauled old man Hopkins out, and he seemed kind of dazed and kept talking about earthquakes. You better get to work extricating your misguided kin from under them logs, you hoary-haired old sarpent, I told him sternly. After that their display of ingratitude, I got no sympathy for you. In fact, if I was a short-tempered man, I'd feel inclined to violence. But being the soul of kindness and generosity, I controls my emotions and merely remarks that if I wasn't mild-mannered as a lamb, I'd hand you a boot in the pants, like this. I kicked him gentle. Ow! says he, sailing through the air and sticking his nose to the hilt in the dirt. I'll have the law on you, you darn murderer! He wept, shaking his fists at me, and as I departed with my captive, I could hear him chanting a hymn of hate as he pulled chunks of logs off his bellerin' relatives. Jackson was trying to say something, but I told him I weren't in no mood for perlite conversation, and the less he said, the less likely I was to lose my temper and tie his neck into a knot around a blackjack. Captain Kidd made the hundred miles from the Mesquital Mountains to Bear Creek by noon the next day, carrying double, 
and never stopping to eat, sleep, nor drink. Them that don't believe that kindly keep their mouths shut. I have already licked nineteen men for acting like they didn't believe it. I stalked into the cabin and throwed Dick Jackson down on the floor before Ellen, which looked at him and me like she thought I was crazy. What you finds attractive about this coyote, I said bitterly, is beyond the grasp of my dust-coated brain. But here he is, and you can marry him right away. She said, Are you drunk or sunstruck? Marry that good-for-nothing, whiskey swiggin card shootin loafer? Why, ain't been a week since I run him out of the house with a buggy whip. Then he didn't jilt you, I gasped. Him jilt me, I said. I jilted him. I turned to Dick Jackson more in sorrow than in anger. Why, said I, did you boast all over chawed ear about jilting Ellen Elkins? I didn't want folks to know she turned me down, he said sulkily. Us Jacksons is proud. The only reason I ever thought about marrying her was I was ready to settle down on the farm Pap gave me, and I wanted to marry me an Elkins gal so I wouldn't have to go to the expense of hiring a couple of hands and buying a span of mules, and they ain't no use in Dick Jackson threatening to have the law on me. He got off light to what's he'd have got if Pap and my brothers hadn't all been off hunting. They've got terrible tempers. But I was always too soft-hearted for my own good. In spite of Dick Jackson's insults, I held my temper. I didn't do nothing to him at all, except escort him, in sorrow, for five or six miles down the chawed ear trail, kicking the seat of his britches. End of the Feud Buster <laughs>